This is a talk on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, also known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is quite a big deal increasing in the world. In this talk, I have a number of concepts I'd like you to try to latch on to. We'll talk a bit about insulin and its antagonist glucagon, both are your hormones, and uh, a big important concept, insulin resistance syndrome, and it's part of metabolic syndrome. These are very widespread and all are associated with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which I've heard Nuff, Nuffed uh, used for that uh, that um, acronym. I don't like the sound of that, though. Um, this tends to progress through liver inflammation, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and even hepatic carcinoma or liver carcinoma, liver cancer. I'm going to talk a little bit about metagenomics and about the gut liver axis and the importance of the GI microbiome and problems with intestinal barrier integrity uh, that leads to fatty change in the liver. So now I thought I'd begin with a case history. This is John. You may recognize him. We've all seen guys like this. He's a um, jolly, big guy, lives life to the fullest, living in the Western world, enjoying lots of these. He knows what to do with these. He unhinges his jaws. Let's put that away. He, he loves plenty of these, which are fried potato, uh, French fried potatoes, deep fried. He eats lots of these, finishes any he finds left over from other people's boxes, and uh, even for breakfast. And he knows what to do with these. So he, he has a, a fun approach to food, it may seem. And he's got huge appetites. But after a point, he starts to just not feel quite right. He has a meal, he feels discomfort in his belly, the abdomen in the right upper quarter, or right, right upper quadrant of his abdomen, and feels sometimes malaise and fatigue and just doesn't feel as alive as he is used to or accustomed to. So he comes in for a workup. Now, one of the simple things, uh, simple, simply measure the waist circumference. And that's uh, significant uh, in the discussion we're going to have. His abdominal girth or waist is 102 centimeters or a 40 inch waist. I point out here that that is the um, lower uh, level of um, at which um, 102 or above is the point at which uh, one uh, raises suspicion for uh, patients at risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in women with a, a waist measurement of 88 uh, centimeters or 34.6 inches or greater, they're at risk. I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, it doesn't seem like much. Um, also, body mass index is uh, an important number, like hypertension or, or like blood pressure. Everybody should know their blood pressure numbers. If you keep your blood pressure numbers good, you will not suffer. If they're high, get them, get them right medically or by exercise and cut out salt and diet. Uh, whatever it takes to get the numbers good, don't worry about what caused it and you'll, you will live. 
um, without strokes and heart attacks as readily. But body mass index is developed by uh, 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 dividing uh, body mass by the total surface area. Of course, you can do, there, there are tables and uh, body mass index, index calculators. Um, you can uh, uh, see where you stand with it. If you're over 25, that's overweight. If you're over 30, that's obese. If you're over 35, that's morbidly obese. Uh, I worked in uh, an underserved area here, and um, the percentage of patients that were over 35 was incredible. It's uh, an area with higher poverty and uh, poor education in terms of um, personal health. Well, in this case, John has a body mass index of 35. And I chose that number just to emphasize that 35 is the cutoff. 35 and above is morbidly obese. Uh, it does a number of things. It's a, it's a, it takes a toll on one's uh, skeletal system, on their metabolism, and also you are just not structured to accommodate that much extra weight. Uh, patients with that kind of uh, body mass index are at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea because all the tissues thicken. And when your throat relaxes, especially if you sleep on your back and your tongue relaxes and uh, this uh, genio, uh, genioglossus muscle that uh, is in the base of the tongue uh, that curves forward to the genu, inner genu or bend of the jaw holds your tongue forward and allows you to pull your, push your tongue out, to stick your tongue out at someone. Anyway, if that relaxes too much, you're lying on your back, your tongue falls back and corks you like a bottle and you'll have snoring and if you start to have uh, sufficient uh, incidents of episodes of 10 seconds or longer without getting a breath in, that's apnea. Uh, more than five of those uh, um, uh, per hour, I guess, is uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So at any rate, blood pressure, I gave the um, normal numbers there. That's the same for men or women, and uh, it's more stringent than it used to be. And we'll just say that John's um, blood pressure is pushing uh, a bit over the limits of normal. Not severe. Uh, again, in the area where I've worked here, I've had uh, patients I dealt with who were in their 20s with total renal failure because of uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, they were on dialysis in their early 20s, all because of blood pressure. So this is a serious uh, kind of number. I want to make one more point on this slide before I leave it. Uh, fructose is a key catalyst in the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's supported in the literature. And generally, ultra-processed food, which John seems to like a lot, high-fat, high-carbohydrate, uh, 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 fast food, with, uh, milkshakes or whatever, that sugary sodas uh, seem to uh, be a big part of his diet. For some reason, I went back. Sorry about that. So get one last look at this food because you're not going to eat it anymore, right? Because you'll end up looking like that. <laughs> Miserable. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, I, we did some um, uh, blood tests. Uh, fasting blood sugar was up a little bit. I try to get normals on these. There's an, a way to see uh, if someone's had um, extended um, over months um, levels of elevated glucose, uh, glucose tends to glycate or bind uh, to uh, proteins and uh, 
or glycoproteins or complex proteins in the blood if, uh, if it can. Glycerol doesn't do that, but uh, glucose does. Um, and uh, so you can look at glycated hemoglobin, which is from the blood, uh, uh, 1AC. Uh, uh, and someone wrote HbA1c, and I think that's that's a reasonable uh, um, designation. Uh, that's a, that's a quite a useful assay. Uh, triglycerides being elevated uh, is important. And I give the normals for that, and we'll say that he had uh, John had elevation of those, and that can be very uh, often diet-related. Uh, and um, you have in uh, lipid assays uh, or lipid profiles, uh, high-density and low-density lipoproteins, along with total cholesterol. Uh, these lipoproteins are blood proteins that transport cholesterol. You also have very low-density lipoproteins, which are, if those are elevated, those are even more dangerous because they're sort of small particles that are uh, felt to be able to uh, release cholesterol and, uh, into uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, walls of the uh, vessels for development of arteriosclerosis. One thing I'll point out here, and people that have non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease, the development of, uh, accelerated development of coronary artery disease and vascular disease, strokes and heart attacks is uh, quite marked and um, it's often what kills them. So anyway, at, in any case, uh, John needs to change what he's doing. Uh, it, this takes a lot of work and part of uh, people that can give him guidance. So he needs to stop eating starchy foods that, uh, you know, if you ever take a slice of potato and try to uh, just stir fry it, uh, it'll burn readily onto the pan unless uh, you have better Teflon than I can find. Uh, the reason being that the starchy food like that just is a sponge for that soaks them up. So uh, to really cook that, you have to deep fry it. So you have um, a starchy potato, which has uh, vitamin C in it, and the, and the peeling, which is uh, generally uh, not noticeable in French fries, um, but has minerals. Uh, and uh, it's not too bad to eat a potato now and then. But uh, you want to be careful about eating too much in the way of starchy vegetables like potatoes and corn. But moderation is okay. But if you fry it, it's loaded with fat. It jacks up the calorie uh, content. And if you have something like uh, like Wienerschnitzel, you uh, put egg on it and uh, flour and um, um, I, I guess flour on the uh, uh, schnitzel, and then you um, uh, dip it in egg batter, and uh, then bread, uh, bread it, and uh, fry it. Uh, it's all that coating is loaded with fat, even if you have a lean piece of meat. Uh, I don't actually eat meat. I apologize for the phone. I stuck the phone into a drawer, but the base of it seems to still ring. Anyway, let's talk, uh, just to review what this condition is. Steatitosis, steatosis, I guess, uh, is a better pronunciation, or fatty change of the liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. These are all pretty much uh, the same thing, uh, although you can have a spectrum that develops. Uh, the diagnosis of this, you have to start with some suspicion, and you get vague symptoms. Uh, you don't get any point tenderness usually. Uh, um, the tenderness or discomfort's there. It, uh, it's usually intermittent. Um, 
makes you think of some presentations of gallbladder disease. Um, and so I think it's really important that history and physical examination is done well, but it uh, can leave you uh, with just a uh, sense of direction on this without uh, anything definitive. Um, I want to mention um, uh, that there are liver enzymes. I didn't talk about John's liver enzymes, but there are a number of uh, blood tests for the liver. Uh, the one that uh, is most often seen is uh, uh, alkaline phosphatase. Um, that could be from bone or liver. If the liver cells get damaged, they start to leak. Um, and they'll, you'll have increased levels of these enzymes or proteins from the liver in the blood. If you combine uh, uh, GGT, which is uh, um, gamma glutamyl transferase, that's another GGT is, is the way to is the term everyone would use for it. That would help to differentiate from some lesion of the bone, which was causing leakage of alkaline phosphatase from those cells, uh, to um, narrow it down to the liver and liver disease, or to um, um, some sort of biliary disease. The bile ducts come off the liver cells. And then we're, in, we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy in a bit. Um, so, at any rate, uh, it's kind of a tough. Uh, Thing to diagnose without um, getting um, uh, uh, pushy or invasive. Uh, uh, the gold standard is, is a needle biopsy. Uh, that is not too bad, but it hurts and um, it, um, it, it has some patient discomfort and time down and, uh, for a day or so. Uh, and it can have bleeding, which if you hit a real vessel, that could be nasty. So uh, um, at any rate, uh, there's some other things that are, are done. One is uh, uh, fatty liver index is, a, I don't know of anyone using it, but it, it's in the literature, it's an algorithm uh, to develop numbers to determine who's at risk and the algorithm uh, is based on body mass index, waist, girth, triglyceride level, and um, uh, GGT, the uh, liver enzyme I mentioned. So um, easier than that is ultrasound. Um, they just put a probe on your uh, side and um, look at echoes in the liver and try to see if there's fatty change. If there is enough, they might be able to see something. Um, a really brilliant uh, thing that was developed in France around 2002 uh, is the fiber scan, uh, which uh, I described here some, but basically you put an ultrasound transducer up in the inner space between ribs and um, uh, it measures the velocity of a 50 megahertz wave. And if there's fibrosis of the liver or um, uh, change in the consistency of the liver, you'll get some uh, measurements of it in terms of stiffness. And uh, if there's inflammation of the liver, it's always going to be stiffer if there is biliary obstruction, so the bile can't drain from the liver to the GI tract, it will back up and the liver will be stiffer. If there's congestive heart failure or venous congestion from portal hypertension, I'm going to talk about these in a minute, uh, then the liver will be too stiff. And if you have really serious liver disease and it's really scarred up, it seeps and the whole, um, all the structures that are on the portal circulation see serum, and your belly will fill with serum, and uh, uh, it's called ascites. And um, so fibroscan doesn't work so well uh, in, with obesity or these other conditions, but you can actually combine in a tertiary center like uh, University of Michigan, they can do fibroscan MRI. 
So I think you'll see that sort of thing, non-invasive uh, assessment becoming more and more available, which I think is fantastic. But everybody complains about the cost of medicine. This is one of the reasons. Would you rather have a needle? I mean, really. Medicine is a growth industry. I don't know why people don't understand that. Not just in, in growth in terms of uh, knowledge, but growth in terms of the range of services and the things that can be done for you. Um, just to step back a second, and, uh, it was 1916 in the United States, um, it was considered um, uh, uh, Flexner, um, I think his name was, had gone to Germany and came back and, and Americans were uh, training doctors on an apprentice um, um, pattern or uh, system. And uh, Germany had uh, recognizably modern educational approaches to uh, uh, medical education. So at any rate, that was the point at which, as education for physicians in America changed, uh, the average patient after 1916 had a better than 50-50 chance of going in to see a doctor and coming out better than they had been when they entered the door. So things have come a long way. And uh, yeah, no one works for free. but. Um, I don't think they should work for riches either. Uh, I think it should be reasonable, but anyway, I wanted to make a point about that. So here's John, we got his attention. He's ready to be told what's going on. And you can tell him he has two problems. One's about his insulin. I uh, have to educate him a little bit about insulin. It's a hormone, it regulates glucose in the blood, produced by the alpha, uh, actually, I, I wrote that wrong, the beta cells, um, that's an error on the slide. It is produced by the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. There are uh, alpha, beta, and um, delta cells. Um, and the uh, alpha cells produce an antagonistic uh, hormone or a hormone that does sort of the opposite of insulin called glucagon. And his other problem, Aside from insulin, he's developing what we call insulin resistance. And his liver, this large organ in his right upper quadrant, tucked under the rib cage, is dysfunctional. And um, I'll just tell you to do this carefully. You can assess your own liver, and if you're lean, it's easier. I, I can palpate my own liver pretty easily. Uh, I have to reach up underneath my rib cage. If I lie in bed or on a flat surface and let my belly relax, I can palpate my abdomen and um, put my fingers up under my rib cage. Um, if this were a high speed and then you pulled away, it would be a kung fu move. Uh, just, it sounds pretty horrific. Uh, but you can assess if your liver, if you feel the liver edge, it's uh, uh, way up under there, that's okay. If you feel your liver edge at the level of the, of the lower rib, uh, or the lower rib cage, or beyond it, it might be enlarged. You might be able to feel masses if there were any. Uh, I'm not recommending everybody do regular abdominal palpation like breast exams are done. On, uh, uh, by uh, patients on themselves, but I'm uh, just telling you, just, just saying. So definition, insulin resistance, just the insulin, uh, same amount, uh, it's like the old saying, the whiskey ain't working no more. The uh, insulin starts to have less effect and uh, you build up levels of blood sugar, the reason being that the uh, fat cells in the liver are not cooperating. And uh, here's a little diagram. I put this uh, uh, yin and yang uh, picture up for uh, 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 parallel uh, uh, principles. Uh, 
you have um, with increased glucose, the pancreas is stimulated directly uh, in the uh, uh, beta cells of uh, the islets of Langerhans to release insulin. And it acts on the liver, and the liver takes up uh, glucose and stores glycogen. It turns the glucose into a polymer um, for quick energy when it needs it. And about 5% of the liver mass in normal livers can, in, in someone who's well um, nourished, is uh, um, uh, glycogen. If you look at the liver uh, histologically under microscope, you'll see a lot of granular quality to it uh, at high power. Um, and glycogen uh, being stored along with ribosomes, uh, rough RNA, because uh, it has a lot of protein synthesis that goes on the liver. If you understood everything there is to know about the liver's biochemistry and its molecular biology and its physiology, you would be uh, quite a master. Um, it is an, it's an extraordinary organ. Uh, so at any rate, it gets the fat cells to take up uh, uh, glucose and fatty acids, and uh, uh, it gets muscle to take up uh, glucose, and um, the uh, um, um, storage of energy is, is promoted. If you have decreased glucose, the uh, glucagon, on the other hand, in the bottom of the slide, uh, causes the liver to break down its glycogen and release glucose if needed. And uh, so it's all about keeping the glucose levels uh, in balance. So this is an idea I thought that was worth mentioning. Adipose tissues come to be regarded by many in the literature as an endocrine organ, an organ that secretes hormones. And it years ago, it used to be just thought of as a, like, you know, a warehouse for extra calories. Um, it's the largest endocrine organ. I'd like you to kind of remember that. Um, there's over a hundred factors um, that it, it's involved in that uh, uh, mediate or control metabolism. An endocrine function can be autocrine, meaning cells secrete something that acts on itself, uh, or paracrine, where the cells secrete mediators, biochemical mediators that act on regional or local cells, or an endocrine. Uh, um, proper, which means that uh, it, uh, uh, the uh, biomolecules uh, elaborated um, act systemically, uh, can act, it can be released from your gut and act on your brain, for instance. <laughs> um, okay. And I won't read the slide, I assume you're reading them, but uh, it has uh, a lot of effects on how you feel and how you're functioning. This is just, uh, I thought it was a great slide, uh, and I, so I borrowed it when I, I have uh, information I took from a specific place uh, to get credit, but also to uh, give a way for um, everyone to uh, be able to uh, uh, Find more information, uh, I give the source. Uh, I thought this diagram just was a beautiful little simplified statement of uh, the complexity of the uh, adipose tissue as an endocrine uh, structure. Uh, leptins uh, are um, one of those uh, hormones that uh, are produced by uh, the uh, adipose tissue that uh, tell you you're hungry, and uh, leptin resistance, like insulin resistance, you can have resistance to all kinds of signals. Uh, in this case, leptin resistance is associated with uh, 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 obesity uh, increasingly. 
there's um, roles of the uh, adipose tissue and um, the immune system that interacts with the liver and muscle. So uh, we should keep going, I think. All right. So that's insulin resistance. It's quite a big deal, and it's quite widespread. And it's part of a bigger condition called metabolic syndrome, which seeing a patient like John, one should uh, suspect outright. Insulin resistance is the deadly quartet, the secret killer. And that's pretty well described because this stuff kills you. Uh, insulin resistance, hypertension, insulin resistance in and of itself tends to promote weight gain and worsening insulin resistance. It's, it's quicksand. Um, high, um, high triglyceride levels and reduced um, high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. That's, uh, imagine like an open pickup truck. Uh, that comes around to pick up the garbage cans and it just dumps them in the back and drives down the street and half of it falls on the street. Uh, so you have to go out and clean up that garbage or else you'll be driving through it. That's sort of the way low density lipoproteins work. They're not very efficient compared in uh, bonding cholesterol and um, taking it um, uh, securely to its destination as our high density lipoprotein um, um, uh, carriers or transports. So I just wanted to mention if you, uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, goes on, including vascular disease that reflects inflammation. Uh, it can be diffuse or systemic, um, but C-reactive protein is a marker for inflammation that's uh, often looked at. And I wanted to mention it because it's often um, found to be elevated in metabolic syndrome, but you may hear of it otherwise as well. C-reactive protein. Okay, so this is a review slide just to get us back to our thoughts on it. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's a spectrum, clinical and histopathological changes that can go from simple fatty change, steatosis, to steatosis with inflammation, to um, cirrhosis, where you start to get scarring. And cirrhosis is, from whatever cause, it could be, it used to be uh, clearly um, most common from alcoholism and um, hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C a viral hepatitis C. You can treat that now, it's quite expensive, but it's less expensive than having people die young and not being productive and able to lead their lives. Uh, and uh, it's, it's curable with medications, really. Uh, but at any rate, um, if you get scarring and cirrhosis, you are at greater risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a bit. Um, because these risk factors, overweight to obesity, type two diabetes, meaning type one diabetes is where there's just not enough insulin. It's often basically an autoimmune thing, knocks off your insulin producing cells in the pancreas and it occurs in very frequently in teenagers or children. And they become insulin dependent um, the rest of their lives unless they get a um, 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 islet cell transplant. Um, and I, I knew of a person who uh, had struggled with type 1 diabetes all their lives, all their life, and uh, had an um, islet cell transplant and um, suddenly did not need insulin anymore. Uh, you have worries about um, uh, uh, rejection of transplanted uh, tissue. It's not from your own. Uh, it, they're, they're, they're distinguishing uh, um, antigens on the uh, cell surface if it's from another person. So the, your, your immune system can kill it. Uh, but you still have to take some medicine. But you don't have to be taking insulin all, all the time. And that individual 
was depressed by the whole situation, believe it or not. But it's actually quite understandable. So much of their energy and concern their whole life had been maintaining, staying alive. They'd, they had had a couple of episodes of uh, becoming comatose uh, with uh, excessive insulin or uh, missing doses when they were non-compliant when they were younger, that sort of thing, but it, their whole life had been wrapped around that. So type 2 diabetes is where you just start to outstrip the ability of the uh, pancreas to keep up with your needs and your tissues don't respond to the insulin. So you have plenty of insulin that's being produced, more than uh, one would think is needed, but it's not working. I can say the whiskey ain't working no more. It's like that song. Um, and uh, so, and finally, uh, dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia, high triglyceridemia, uh, all these are worldwide uh, in distribution. This condition is has a prevalence worldwide of about 20%. One in five human beings have non-alcohol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, like I say, it's a big deal. So this is just an image of what the liver looks like when it starts to get fatty change. It, it can get enlarged and its color changes a bit. This is a gross um, um, macro image or, or uh, uh, not, not a microscopic, but uh, also has a cut edge there. You can see, uh, basically uh, vessels, probably um, venous vessels as holes. But uh, this is even more so, uh, yellowish looking. Um, so we tell John the diagnosis. He's not too happy. This is uh, difficult for someone who's lived large and uh, suddenly has to learn that they're uh, going to have to change their ways or not going to make it. So he goes through five stages of grief, which I throw in here just to uh, share it. It starts with denial. Yeah, he has a beer bottle in his hand. Well, you never believe anyone when they say they don't drink at all. Uh, you can always check a um, alcohol level, um, but uh, I don't want to be like uh, the house you uh, um, Lori uh, character and say that people always lie, but uh, they always tell you what they want to tell you because they always want to present themselves in the best way. And I had a patient once who told me uh, detail about his uh, uh, alcohol use and I documented it in the notes and um, um, he came in and wanted me to rewrite it or uh, eliminate that from the notes because uh, he had been denied insurance. His insurance company dropped him because they got a hold of those notes and uh, thought he was at risk for alcoholism. And um, I told him I couldn't change the notes, but I could add a statement and I, I basically added that I had had a further discussion with him and he had indicated that uh, uh, the, there was misunderstanding and uh, that his uh, level of alcohol use was moderate, which was what he was insisting and that I had no real reason to doubt his uh, veracity or truthfulness on that. Uh, that's the best I could do. You can't change what's documented. You can't go back and erase an entry. So. Then he got angry. Then he got into a bargaining stage. We're like, let's make a deal. He bargained with uh, the uh, uh, great mystery, uh, whatever that is for the individual. And finally, sadness and then acceptance. And I liked this guy. And I felt like he wouldn't mind being remembered in this lecture. And he wasn't that big. He was kind of a, 
uh, robust fellow, but he wasn't, I don't know that he was morbidly obese, but I just uh, used that to, for heuristic purposes. So, he was not my patient, by the way. He was just somebody I liked. Uh, the liver, right upper quadrant, it's got these lobes. It's got a, a falciform ligament in between these two major lobes. And there are a couple of small minor lobes that are sort of historic. And, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know that he had any liver. He probably, he probably had fatty liver. Uh, when he died, but um, he died of an OD, um, and he would have lived many years, um, might have died of a heart attack or a stroke from vascular disease, especially using uh, potent, dangerous substances like cocaine, but uh, it was quite sad. Yeah, this is uh, by Netter. He was born, I think, in 1903 and died in 1992, I believe. He tr went to medical school. He was an artist and went to medical school at NYU, uh, New York University. And then he just, uh, in 1930, I guess 1933 to 1993, he was active uh, uh, and spent about 60 years doing uh, art, um, uh, of medical art. And they, they were just fabulous pictures because he had such a uh, good understanding of the anatomy from having studied medicine. So, um, and also understanding of what's important to be able to deal with pathology and disease and understand what's normal. I just point out here, this on the top view, there's this little um, string hanging down. It's called the ligamentum teres. That runs to your belly button. That is a remnant of an umbilical vein that turns into a fibrous cord. So uh, uh, this uh, everything's connected. One of the things that happens if you get real hardened uh, cirrhotic liver is that the um, uh, blood flow through the liver. I'm going to show you what's called the portal circulation in a couple minutes. The blood flow through the liver is impeded because the liver becomes a high resistance element. The blood from the gut is supposed to flow through the liver and be processed and then drained to the caval system, like the superior and inferior vena cava, actually inferior vena cava, which is the same way blood from your hand drains to the heart. Uh, well, blood from your feet. Blood from your hand would go to the superior vena cava. But at any rate, um, if you get cirrhosis real severely, one of the things you can have is uh, these veins that run along the ligamentum teres uh, to the umbilicus become dilated. I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. but. Here's some, um, oh, let's see. I changed my view here. Hold on one second. Um, I hit my forward key on my computer keyboard rather than on the, on the slide projector here. This is the backside of the liver reflected upwards. This green is the gallbladder. Uh, one of the functions of the liver is to produce bile. You have the hepatic cells, the hepatocytes are, yes, I'm going to point out Caput um, um, Medusa in a, in a minute. Um, uh, you have um, choline and uh, deno deoxycholine, um, I think it is, uh, the main bile salts, and mixed with bil bilirubin uh, that. Um, get concentrated in the gallbladder and when the acidic uh, material like kind of fatty acids or amino acids get to the first section of the duodenum which is connected to the stomach um, you have cholecystokinin uh, uh, released and uh, it uh, it uh, you get actual contraction of the 
bile that's stored in the uh, gallbladder and it's uh, excreted into the duodenum, the second portion of the duodenum. And that is a place above that place as uh, everything is from the foregut, basically above where the um, uh, fetus has an umbilicus. And everything past the um, place where the duodenum's uh, bile and the common duct empties uh, pancreatic enzymes is from the hindgut. So that's an anatomically important point. It's also marked by the ligament of trites, but uh, just anatomical features. There's also or this adipose tissue here. I'm touched, I have a touch sensitive screen. Adipose tissue here, a lesser omentum between the uh, uh, underside of the uh, liver and the uh, uh, lesser curvature of the stomach, and then this apron, greater omentum that hangs off the greater curvature of the stomach, and it's um, that's belly fat. Uh, you know, a lot of the belly fat that people talk about. That's what they're talking about there, and that's that's uh, part of this uh, adipose endocrine tissue. One last point before I go on is this: uh, this, this liver is sort of suspended. Uh, from the diaphragm. The diaphragm is like a, a, a dome. Imagine walking into a dome and um, um, uh, looking up, you know, can, like in the Renaissance uh, 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 architecture. Uh, the diaphragm is like that, and around the periphery of it are muscles that contract to pull the diaphragm down to expand the lungs. And the liver is kind of tucked up in that concavity. Um, so, okay, this is a, an important slide. Portal system. You have uh, mesenteric artery um, increases blood flow to the gut when you have food being processed, and the gut meaning the intestines, and um, so you get absorption, and it drains into this portal vein, which then percolates through the liver. So the liver actually has a superhighway connection with the intestines. That's what we would call the gut-liver axis. And if for some reason you had something affect the GI tract, especially the large co the colon, the large bowel, um, like dysbiosis, abnormal bacteria, and um, you can have uh, unfavorable biomolecules, uh, lipopolysaccharides, uh, endotoxins, uh, things like that that manage to get uh, into the portal circulation. And that's uh, apparently quite related to diet. And uh, fructose is a big stimulant, like I mentioned. Um, you know, so you look at all these ultra-processed foods that have high fructose corn syrup, don't buy it. I, I just, I won't buy any of that stuff. Every time I see a treat, I think, oh, I buy this. I, I start to look at the ingredients, and then I never buy it. <laughs> I know, Debbie Downer. Uh, so let's see. So remember the portal circulation. The other thing is, you see this is a, it's only about a five millimeter um, um, on based mercury, millimeters of mercury pressure uh, system. It's a low pressure system. Um, and uh, if it encounters this, uh, this liver uh, as a high resistance uh, uh, situation, then uh, there are a couple places where the uh, portal system can develop uh, better communication with the cable system. One is at the bottom of the uh, esophagus and upper stomach, um, especially esophageal veins. They all become dilated, varicose, varicosities, uh, varicose esophageal veins. Also, you can get varicosities in the rectum to get blood from that's trapped in the portal system and where you have portal hypertension, you get excessive blood pressure in the portal system. And so you get hemorrhoids. 
And the other is you can have um, this excessive blood uh, uh, develop uh, uh, varicosities along this uh, pathway parallel to the ligamentum teres to the umbil umbil umbilical area or umbilicus. And you can get distension of veins in the belly wall that you can see that look like hair or snakes of Medusa. That's the caput Medusa. That's a horrific thing. That's in, generally in someone with terrible ascites, uh, where they mostly have muscle wasting and they have um, uh, a belly that looks like it's been blown up. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ludwig von Beethoven had this, and uh, he had uh, his ascites drained uh, a number of times, and uh, one of the important functions of the liver is also to uh, detoxify uh, 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 alcohol, is uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, and the first step is to make aldehyde, which is toxic even more than alcohol is, and it's uh, a carcinogen as well, which is one reason why in people that drink uh, with or without smoking, they have increased risk of oral, pharyngeal, esophageal cancers because of the um, effects of um, alcohol on those tissues. You get a little bit of, um, and in the stomach as well. So with the esophageal varices, I had one patient that I never will forget uh, that I uh, was part of the team and taking care of her in um, training. She was, I'll just say mid twenties, and she um, appeared to have her entire problem from alcohol abuse. And she was a nice person, but she was, uh, somewhat defiant about quitting alcohol. She's maybe bent on self-destruction or whatever. There were things going on that were beyond what anybody knew how to manage. Uh, and I'm talking about psychiatric aspects, but she developed an esophageal bleed. The esophageal varices, they are exposed to acid, and it's a harsh environment there at the top of the esophagus, especially if someone has reflux of acidic material and few enzymes from the stomach. And the surface of these real dilated veins can get broken down and start to bleed. People with this terrible liver disease often have, uh, well, generally, they, they will always bleed more. They have coagulopathy. They don't make, uh, you can assess that by doing a, a prothrombin, prothrombin type uh, measurement. Well, she wouldn't clot. She wouldn't stop bleeding. We gave nearly 100 units of packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, and uh, platelet transfusions. And finally, the team uh, I, I was not, I was um, a subordinate. I was very disturbed by this, but they gave it up. She wouldn't say she would stop drinking. So they basically let her go and she died. Um, there are a lot of cases like that that you experience in this kind of career that you just can't forget. Okay, um, hope I don't run over too much here. And I got a couple more points to make. The this is really important. There's um, this is a Netter picture, also Frank Netter. Um, those are a bit dated, but they are so uh, um, beautifully informative. Um, liver uh, lobules are that's really the functional unit in the liver. You have central veins. It's marked by a C here, and then you have a portal triad which has a biliary drainage um, from the side of the uh, uh, liver cells that are producing bile, and that drains separately. And then you've got uh, a, a, a portal vein uh, and um, um, a hepatic artery. And, uh, oh, I keep hitting my keyboard here, I'm sorry. So. 
It's presenter dysfunction. Uh, here's a couple pictures I'll just show quickly. It's it's really a labyrinth. You'd be uh, down lower left here is this the, the portal triad, and uh, here dropping down, it's, this almost looks like a plumbing outfit. Is the central vein, and it has uh, uh, radiating uh, sinusoids that run from the portal triad to the central vein, which is in the center of the lobule. So this, this is a lobule cut sort of from the center, so you see the very center of it in the right there. And they used to talk about these in terms of cords, and some of the cells, uh, some of the pictures I'm going to show you will show, looks like cords of hepatocytes, but actually they're plates. The better uh, description of it is plates. And this is with all the, uh, um, this is also from Netter. Again, this is just so instructive. Um, shows what the hepatic cells look like without uh, all the um, uh, vascular and uh, ductal structures. By the way, the liver also has an innervation, which is synthetic and parasymp parasympathetic, and uh, has lymphatic drainage. Uh, drains to regional mesenteric lymph nodes and such. So if you get a liver cancer, you may get, get it spreading to um, adjacent nodes through lymphatic drainage. Now, I want you to imagine for a second that you plant three different plants in one pot. In this case, uh, you, uh, you would have all these root systems that seem to get just intertwined um, and root bound together. Um, that's sort of what the liver is. If it gets messed up, it's hard to fix. Um, but it's it's like you've got the portal vein tree and you have the biliary tree. Now the biliary tree represents drainage from the liver to the GI tract. The portal vein is blood going from the GI tract into the uh, into the um, uh, liver and the hepatic artery goes, uh, uh, which is from the aorta uh, via the, um, uh, well, uh, celiac trunk, but I won't get into that too much, but um, about 25% of the blood supply to the liver cells comes in through the hepatic artery. 75% of the blood supply to the liver is through the portal vein, and then the whole thing drains out through a hepatic vein, which goes, uh, you see it coming out at the top there, uh, which goes to the cable system. And um, this is, I actually got from Wikipedia, which I usually don't take stuff from, but, and I get the credit for it, but it's uh, just such a nice explanation of uh, some of the cell types that you have in the liver. It shows these cuboidal cells, and um, on the top there where you have the yellow, it's, um, that's the aspect of the you know, cuboidal cells where they secrete, uh, pr produce bile and secrete it, um, probably by um, uh, extravasation of vesicles. Um, on the sinusoids, the lower part is a sinusoid going from, the, on the left they show this, um, the portal triad area with, um, um, the mesenteric blood flowing in, that's bluish, and uh, then hepatic arteriole. And as it hits the liver, the, the hepatic artery is from the um, aorta uh, and the uh, left heart. That's high pressure, but it, it loses its uh, mojo as it goes through various levels of resistance. And uh, so it actually mixes with the sinusoidal blood um, that's from the portal vein. So you get um, kind of richer oxygenation once you get uh, the um, hepatic arterial oil, oil in there. Um, and they drain to the central vein, which eventually drains out the uh, uh, hepatic vein. There's a couple of cells here. You look at this uh, octopus-looking cell that's on the roof of that sinusoid called a Kupfer cell. That's a macrophage, and it's got a lot of surface area, and it's it's uh, sampling uh, 
for pathogens and damaged red blood cells and uh, it absorbs toxins as well. And um, uh, you have stellate cells, which I think there's, there's a thing called the space of DC, which is uh, between these um, uh, line of um, hepatocytes uh, pointed out. And there are what are called stellate cells. I don't know that they're, um, oh, there's on the lower right there uh, is, is a stellate cell pointed out. Those are really important. Uh, the um, Kupfer cells uh, and some T cells, including natural killer cells, they're not in high population normally, but they reside, and the, the number of na natural killer cells in the liver is pretty well controlled. But you've got potential for uh, a lot of inflammation, and the liver uh, is actually pretty tolerant. Uh, it, it puts up with a lot of insult before it gets, um, gets angry. Uh, but uh, you don't want to abuse it. And because uh, once it turns on you and you start to get inflammation, and you kick up the stellate cells. The stellate cells will lay down fibrosis. They will lay down scar. You start to get scarring of your liver, you get ir irreversible change. So here's normal human liver. You can see how there seems to be cords, and they, it shows the portal triad lower left and the central vein on the right, and they, the nests, they just point about three zones. One point about it, the zone three, I think it's on the next slide. Zone three is the better oxygenated. Uh, I'm saying that wrong. I guess zone one is where you get more oxygenated blood, and the, the poorest oxygenation is right before it drains out, which makes sense. I was saying it backwards. And zone two is in between. So this area one is uh, where you start to get uh, support. Uh, blood supply from the hepatic artery, but still that's only 25% of the blood supply of the liver. And once again, I want to make sure we remember what we're talking about, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's a spectrum where you get fatty liver and not from alcohol or viral hepatitis, and it can go bad on you, become fibrotic, uh, inflamed, uh, fibrotic and cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease. It's soon expected to be, maybe by 2020, to be the number one need or cause to need a liver transplant in the United States. Uh, and worldwide, it's got a parallel increase in uh, incidence. Uh, and liver cancer um, is also uh, a definite risk, as with any cirrhosis. And yeah, you know, they've had children two years old that have uh, fatty liver disease. Uh, it's not, it doesn't spare children. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I wanna show some slides quickly. This is, uh, I've, I've run over a bit. If you can give me a couple of minutes, uh, this will be reasonably quick, I think. Steatitosis in non-fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, you see all these little clear vesicles. Those are fat collections. Those are basically fat collected in hepatocytes. And I have the source here for that particular slide. That's what it looks like grossly. We saw that a little earlier. Um, and in this one, you see these bluish areas. This is an H and E. Hematoxylin eosinophen. Hematoxylin is uh, um, basic and eosin is somewhat acidic. And it dates back to mid 19th century and uh, particularly in Germany when uh, organic dyes were invented by chemists and they were applied to stain not just textiles but tissues. And it made it possible for Koch to become the godfather of pathology. At any rate, um, the smaller um, um, uh, bluish gatherings of cells are uh, inflammatory uh, infiltrates. Um, these little blue dots you see generally are nuclei. The hematoxylin being um, basic, 
uh, tends to bind to um, uh, nucleic acids and the eos eosinophil tends uh, are the eosin uh, 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 being uh, acidic uh, can show areas where protein is more dominant. So you get a, a pinkish background. They stain with one rinse and stain with the other one and rinse and let it dry. These are on very slim uh, slides created on microtone. Here's another with H and E, I guess, uh, hepatocellular injury, and you get ballooning, which means imminent cell death. And Mallory Dink bodies in, inside the cell, you have this really fine architecture of proteinaceous filaments that are submicroscopic. But uh, when you get damage, intracellular damage, you start to get hyalinization. Hyaline is kind of a loose term in a way. It, 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 a lot of things have a hyaline look, uh, but basically a smear of protein and these pinkish areas that I guess I guess um, uh, they're marked out here with um, um, the. Uh, white area, uh, can you see a white area over there? Yeah, down here uh, at about uh, five o'clock is a white arrow indicating a Mallory Dink uh, body which shows uh, significant hepatic injury. And if you do a reticular stain, that's a, a, a ammoniated uh, um, silver stain, which um, is picked up particularly by collagen-3. So this is to look for fibers produced by fibrocytes or collagen-forming cells, um, like those stellate cells, um, in the liver, and we get chicken wire patterns with scarring. That's the beginning of real problems. Here you have pretty severe cirrhosis, and you have this clumps, these islands of regenerative cells, and a lot of fibrosis around them. Uh, the liver will try to heal itself. It's, it does have the potential to regenerate, and uh, it, it'll last you a lifetime if you're careful with it. Here's what the uh, liver grossly looks like, and this is pretty severe. Uh, uh, like they say, macronodular cirrhosis, because you see clumpiness. And here's a picture with carcinoma. And I don't know if you can tell there's fatty change and there's inf inflammatory change, but also there's total loss of architecture and, and the cell morphology is varied. And I have a close up of it. And if you look here, just left of center, for instance, that, that's a nice clump with, um, you have, you know, the nucleolus is uh, area of uh, um, RNA production, uh, of ribosome production in, in the nucleus, and liver cells tend to have that. But these liver cells, none of them is, is sort of like listening to a, a hillbilly play a, a bluegrass tune. They never play it the same way twice. And these cells all look different. Uh, they have slight distinctions. And so you have varied morphology. You don't have uniform uh, structure to the cells. And um, the organization of the tissue has been lost. And so here's another one. This actually shows some normal hepatocytes on the left. And this is infiltrating hepatocarcinoma on the right. At one time, I did a long rotation as a medical student at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, um, uh, in pathology. It was one of the most wonderful places to do pathology. I, I actually love this uh, kind of stuff, but uh, I'm not a pathologist. This is a hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a big one up yep. right there in the center. And that's, it's sort of greenish because it's bile, this, these things happen, the biliary uh, function gets disrupted and bile tends to build up. So, fast food, forget about it. 
No more of this stuff. Take one last good look. Say bye-bye. Buh-buh. This, maybe a couple times a year. <laughs> I mean, we're only human. So, metagenomics was one point I wanted to make. When you look at, because um, I have one last quick, I think it would be quick thing to bring up. You look at the microbiome of the GI tract. Uh, it's easier to determine what's there than it is to determine how much. To determine how much, the traditional ways was to take smears and on uh, cultures, street cultures, and see what cells grew out and what quantity, and uh, or to look at smears and if you could count the types of uh, specific cells by staining. But uh, in this, you take a whole uh, a, a sample of all the uh, life structures in a specific sample or from a particular environment, and you look at some marker. And um, this is, I just wanted to mention, 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing is a nice way to do this, and they can tell a lot about what bacteria are present in the gut. So the gut has, um, actually in the more recent literature, about um, the equal number of, maybe about oh, 35, uh, 3.5 uh, times 10 to the 13th cells in the body. Uh, 35 trillion, and actually the recent numbers on uh, the concentrate or the number of uh, bacteria in the uh, large bowel are um, uh, about the same number as the total number of cells in the body. Many people consider in the literature the microbiome of the GI tract to be an organ. Some talk about it as being um, the uh, uh, an integrated organ, and uh, there uh, is a list here of bacteria that uh, get pathogens in there, you know it pretty well, and that's probably the results of having a pathogen like Shigella or Salmonella or something of this sort is probably part of how the Greeks came up with the black, black bile as being a uh, one of the humors. Another possibility with that is uh, an upper GI bleed. It gets to, the blood gets digested, and when on excretion, the blood is uh, uh, black tarry stools, uh, or maybe unformed black tar. Uh, any rate, there are basically two. Most of what I read, it's it, it it's hard to simplify the changes in microbiome with bad diets and good diets, but it's very responsive to diet. If you have a lousy microbiome that's associated with non-alcoholic st uh, uh, um, steatohepatitis, and you go on a healthy diet, and maybe with probiotics, with fermented foods, uh, it'll shift and become uh, more, the, the simplest terms I could find were um, a little bit less of the bacterial rotides phylum and more of the firmicutes phylum. Um, I make my own yogurt. It's a micro, uh, it, it's, it's a bacterial culture of milk and I enrich it with some um, milk powder. Um, and it's uh, got no extra sugars in it. Um, I eat some every day. I eat it on cereal or oatmeal. Uh, Bifidobacterium is also a good, uh, healthy bacteria. And that's, this is a probiotic uh, uh, um, uh, package. I took a picture just to show the sorts of bacteria listed. And uh, I would also point out fiber. Um, uh, aside from probiotics, prebiotics are non-digestible stuff that helps uh, uh, promote the uh, effectiveness of a probiotic or like organisms that will benefit you. Um, 
you really want to look for soluble fermentable fiber. Fiber is stuff that goes through undigested. If you have healthy microbiome in your lower GI tract, it will digest um, fermentable fibers and make beneficial molecules. For one thing, the, uh, the lining cells in the lower GI tract like butyrate, and one of the uh, one of the breakdown products from these bacteria is butyrate. Uh, so close to the end, I want to encourage some healthy stuff to eat. One rule of thumb I've always used to try to teach people uh, is say, when you buy food, uh, get natural food as well as you can, and as many different colors. Those colors are pigments, plant pigments or phytochemicals. They're, they generally have antioxidant um, uh, qualities and are felt to be beneficial that way. But um, uh, the more colors of natural colors of food and the better it's uh, ripened, like if you have a garden of your own versus if you're buying uh, tomatoes picked green in a distant place uh, that ripen uh, without uh, being attached to the vine and without sunlight, uh, uh, they turn reddish. Uh, they don't taste the same as I grew up on a farm and I used to eat a tomato now and then right off a vine just uh, as a snack. And I have never tasted tomatoes since those days that taste like that. They were just wonderful. Um, I tried to grow them myself. My father would grow tomato vines that were like um, about oh, four meters tall. 12, 15 feet. So there's more healthy stuff. And stir frying, don't deep fry. And use uh, olive oil, canola oil, something like this. Don't use saturated fat. And hummus is a wonderful thing. If you talk about grains, um, um, hummus with um, uh, uh, tahini and uh, garbanzo beans, I guess, uh, um, chickpeas, chickpeas. Uh, and uh, I generally eat hummus with uh, uh, celery uh, rather than crackers, and whole grains, and beans, legumes, and uh, uh, I don't eat meat uh, or chicken, but uh, I thought I'd put it out there at least uh, get me eaten. I wouldn't eat the skin on chicken because it has lots of fat. And uh, finally, once again, the terms to remember, insulin, glucagon, uh, insulin resistance syndrome, metabolic syndrome, and our NASH and NAFLD, uh, liver inflammation uh, arising from fatty liver change, becoming fibrotic, cirrhosis, and maybe even developing carcinoma or need for um, uh, liver transplant. Metagenomics we talked about with looking at ribosomal DNA, uh, uh, ribosomal RNA, um, and uh, gut liver axis, uh, the GI microbiome, and um, if you have uh, healthy bacteria, you may not have the leaky gut, which I think really exists, which lets toxins reach the liver. It starts to cause uh, problems in the liver and uh, also may be a catalyst for developing insulin resistance. So all these things work together. So this is a big lifestyle thing I wanted you to know about so you can live long and prosper. And I'll finish by saying uh, these are the best sources I know of for um, uh, uh, medical information. Now I see a question, where in the body is adipose tissue located? Well, the abdominal fat, particularly I think the omentum or apron, that thing that hangs down and the, there's a, the minor one between the lesser curvature of the stomach and the underside of the liver, um, that's reactive uh, uh, 
uh, adipose tissue. Also, you have subcutaneous uh, adipose tissue. Uh, and you have visceral adipose tissue. You have heart, uh, kind of uh, padding uh, around the heart and uh, a lot of places um, that uh, uh, let's see. Any, uh, let's see, I'm trying to, any uh, any questions? By the way, uh, I, uh, I um, I'm happy to share these slides. I made a PDF. I heard someone uh, was impressed with PDF. So on one of the earlier talks, and I am learning quietly how to do these presentations better. I went over a bit, quite a bit, I guess. I'm sorry. But uh, uh, I hope this has been helpful. And uh, uh, I uh, made my slides work for me this time better than I ever had before. I don't think fat, I think fat is uh, necessary in food. I think high fat diets are the problem. Uh, high fat, particularly saturated fats, but like um, these high carbohydrate, high fat, um, salt, and sugar. Uh, these ultra processed foods. I think in eating um, lean animal sources of food and uh, uh, vegetables, fruit, nuts, and uh, now nuts have a lot of calories. I love eating nuts, and I eat about 12 different kinds of nuts a day, and I spread it out so I get to enjoy them all. But uh, uh, because they uh, would uh, probably put weight on me if I didn't, but uh, uh, having a, a, a Fat in the diet in moderation, as do the French, is not such a problem. Especially if you don't end up developing um, uh, insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes or uh, metabolic syndrome. I think France is starting to see more of that as well, though. Um, well, the French, I thought, you tend to have a lot of courses of food, and they're none of them so large. That was my experience with um, when I've eaten with French families. Well, yeah, sugar, but but fat, high fat diet is associated with this disease process. Yeah, uh, alcohol-related uh, changes in the liver, that's different. That's um, alcohol toxicity, which can cause inflammation and fibrosis and um, uh, cirrhosis. And is associated also with hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. I did, uh, I wrote down a note for myself. Um, most of the literature recommends uh, keeping um, uh, the alcohol uh, intake to uh, a max of about um, um, uh, well, let me let me say it this way: one glass of alcohol has uh, 14 grams of pure alcohol. Uh, one one dose, I suppose I should say. Um, if you had uh, eight ounces of beer. I'm sorry, 12 ounces of beer. That's about 14 grams of alcohol. So uh, the upper limit of beer that one might um, consume per day is recommended around 18 ounces uh, or 532 uh, milliliters. Uh, for wine, um, eight ounces of wine or uh, 236 milliliters is uh, the limit. Uh, now, some uh, write 12 ounces for men, 8 ounces for women. That was probably written by a man. Uh, <laughs> uh, then uh, for spirits, for uh, hard alcohol, uh, uh, 2 ounces um, um, or 60 milliliters is the max. 
uh, and beyond that, then you can start to get uh, effects. Another aspect of the metabolism of alcohol is that it feeds into um, uh, the acetyl-CoA uh, uh, system, the citric acid uh, uh, breakout where fatty uh, uh, fat synthesis occurs. Alcohol shunts right into fat synthesis. It's like ingesting pure fat uh, metabolically. Um, I, I think in studying MASH, they try to exclude patients, so it's a reductionist approach, uh, exclude patients who consume more alcohol than what I listed uh, verbally there a minute ago. Um, because it becomes uh, multifactorial otherwise. Uh, it, and NASH already is a multi-hit disease. It's associated with the insulin resistance and high triglycerides and uh, um, uh, obesity or increased abdominal girth and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so I think if you uh, are... Uh, Drinking too much, you're going to have uh, um, toxicity uh, to the liver just from the alcohol and the uh, aldehyde that's produced from it. It's also neurotoxic. Um, I see a lot of people of uh, great talent who uh, seem to hang on to their uh, intellectual abilities a uh, long time despite their alcohol abuse, but uh, it does take a toll on neural function. I don't think there's any question on that. High blood uh, cholesterol. Um, that's really a good question. Uh, if you have high, uh, high de levels of high density lipoproteins, so you have efficient transport, um, then not necessarily. Um, and you don't have high blood pressure and uh, family history. Uh, I'm sorry about the phone again. Uh, or um, uh, smoking of tobacco. Um, uh, uh, all those promote um, vascular disease. Um, I got to figure a better way to deal with the phone for the next time. Oh, I, I got the actual phone stuck in a drawer. I didn't realize the bass was what rang. <laughs> so, and any other questions? I think yeah, that's a good question uh, um, about VMI when someone's muscular. I think that one has to, if you have an athlete, uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, and that's where there are other assessments for uh, fat. You can do um, uh, assessment of um, sub-Q fat by uh, measurement uh, under the arm and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, there are ways of um, uh, looking at um, weight and height and impedance uh, to determine the total body fat. Uh, so I think if somebody is very muscular but has a low body fat, uh, then uh, I think the BMI is probably uh, not uh, so applicable to them if it's high. I don't know, uh, Ariane, uh, about that. If uh, everyone has potential to develop non-alcohol uh, uh, steatohepatitis uh, without obesity, uh, maybe. Uh, some people, I think there's certainly genetic uh, predispositions uh, that some people handle 
certain things better than others um, and certain lifestyles better than others. Uh, I mean, look at Keith Richards. He should have been dead a long time ago. Uh, um, but um, uh, most people would have been. Um, it doesn't, uh, uh, there are people that are lean who have it. So uh, certainly um, it, you can have it without having obesity. I don't know that everyone has the potential to get it without uh, uh, obesity though. So any, any other? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and uh, hope this helps you live a long, healthy life.